Psalm 27, 1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? <sighs> Let's find great joy in that today. On this third Sunday of Advent, the Joy Sunday, we come to, to give God our attention, to give Him our love and our praise, and to find our joy in Him. Hi, I'm Dave Ruppert, the pastor of First Reformed Church, and it is always an honor to gather with you here online or to gather with you on campus to worship God to study the scriptures together in order that we may be even uh, better worshipers of a great God who has shown his love for us in Jesus Christ. And so we've gathered here in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Hear these words from the book of Nehemiah. When the book of the law was being read and their encouragement to the people in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, it says, Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. May the joy of the Lord be your strength today. And so may grace and peace be yours from God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Let's worship.
Isn't it good to sing praise to the Lord? I pray that that was a blessing to you um, as you listened and maybe even as you sang uh, there in your homes. The more that we can exalt God and get our eyes on Him and not on the problems around us, the more we realize just how much joy He has to give to us. Worship follows a sort of a general rhythm. Um, yes, we come and we sing and we give God glory, but there's also a section of our worship where we take a deep look inwards. This glory to uh, guilt is not necessarily um, you know, a break screeching thing. It's, uh, it's a way for us to give God even more glory, to recognize our own sinfulness. And then we are reminded of His grace um, and then we share our gratitude with Him. And so let's do that second part. Have you loved the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength? Have you loved your neighbor as yourself? Let's examine our lives. I'm going to pray, and then at the end, I'm going to invite you to pray out loud with me as we finish this time of confession. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we have locked ourselves out, each of us, in our own way. We've locked ourselves out of our, our relationships. We've locked ourselves out of relationships with you, relationships with others. We've locked ourselves out from opportunities in our lives because of our own sinfulness and because of our of our pride and our fear. We've locked ourselves out of our true home because sometimes we're just so arrogant and we don't want to humble ourselves before you. In many ways, we have just been simply too human this past week. We filled our our minds, our attention with the things of the world, things that lead to death and not to life, things that lead to lead to sadness and not joy, things that have stirred up anxiety and not peace, things that have caused us to despair and not to hope. Father, this Advent season is not about that. This Advent season is about our hope in you and the and the return of our Savior, our Advent's about peace, the peace that comes through your grace. Advent's about joy and, and focusing on you and not on the brokenness of this world. It's about your love. It's about Jesus. So forgive us when we make life about ourselves, because as we make it about ourselves, we lock ourselves out. We keep you at arm's length. We keep others at a distance. And so, Father, we admit at times we are lost. At times we need, we need to be reminded of your light. We need to be reminded of your joy. We need to be reminded of the hope we have in Christ Jesus. Pray along with me. Come, Lord Jesus, forgive us and restore us. Come, Lord Jesus, guide us and deliver us. Come, Lord Jesus, teach us and renew us. Come, Lord Jesus. We pray this in your name, our Savior. Amen. Hear these words from Romans 3, uh, chapter 3, verses 21 through 26. I know it's a, a larger text than we usually read, but I want you to hear the words of Scripture. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by, the, by, by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. God loves his children so much. If you are a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ, know that God has done that work in you. And so rejoice, rejoice. God is not going to undo what he's done in your life.
The song He Touched Me, one of my favorite songs of all time, I recorded it many years ago, was written by Bill and Gloria Gaither back in 1964. We'd like to sing it for you today, He Touched Me. Shackled with a heavy burden, neath a load of guilt and shame. Then the hand of Jesus touched me, and now I am no longer the same. He touched me, oh, he touched me. Something happened, and now I know He touched me and made me whole. Since I met my blessed Savior, since He cleansed and made me whole, I will never cease to praise Him. I'll shout it while eternity rolls. He touched me, oh, he touched me. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened, and now I know he touched me. song we would like to share is entitled Never Grow Old and it's a beautiful song that depicts oh, yeah. what it's going to be like in heaven someday yes. oh, that my goodness, there yes. will be no sickness no mm -hmm. sorrow no illness at all as well as no aging so we will never grow old once we reach the heavenly shore and we'd like to share this with you today okay. never, grow old. never Grow Old this is a song I've been singing since I've been a teenager singing with my mom. Never grow old. I have heard of the land on a far away strand. It's a beautiful home of the soul. Built by Jesus on high, where we never shall die. It's a land where we'll never grow old. We'll never grow old, never grow old. In a land where we'll never grow old. Never grow old, we'll never grow old. In a land where we'll never grow old. When our work here life crown is one and our troubles and trials are all our sorrows will end and our voices will blend with the loved ones who've gone on before we'll never grow old never grow old in a land where we'll never
worship God by studying his word, applying it to our lives, and then living it out this coming week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we recognize that you are truth. You've communicated your truth to us through Jesus, who was the radiance of your glory, the exact representation of who you are, and came to this earth to not only to save us from our sins, but to show us the Father. And Father, we believe that your word reveals who you are to us, reveals Jesus to us. And so we ask that you fill us with your Holy Spirit. Help us to understand and apply these words to our lives, primarily, Father, to glorify you, to bring you glory, to be a blessing to others. We want so much for the world to see how great you are, how loving you are in sending your son Jesus, how powerful you are through your life-changing spirit. So we commit now to study, to apply, and to live it out. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 3, verses 7 through 18. We're going to continue the text that we started last week and see the continuation of this story of John the Baptist interacting with people who had come out to be baptized by him. John, uh, Luke chapter 3, starting in verse 7, we'll be reading through verse 18. Brothers and sisters, this is the gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now, the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree that does not bear fruit, good fruit, is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then shall we do? And he answered them, Whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax, collector, tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what shall we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation, and be content with your wages. And the people were in expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John whether he might be the Christ. John answered them all, saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. Brothers and sisters, this is the gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Well, now that we have launched one of our children from the nest, we know the excitement that parents now have when, when they're expecting their kids to come home, come home for a holiday. Unfortunately, our Marine wasn't able to come home for Thanksgiving, and we're not so sure what's going to happen for Christmas, but we are definitely hopeful and look forward to the next time that we are able to be with our son. Millions of families all across the United States right now, and I'm going to say probably the world, are trying to navigate this, this holiday season through COVID-19 and all kinds of other things. And for many of those families, they will decide that there will be some kind of a homecoming, and there will be this real joy as family members get together. Some of them maybe have not seen each other for weeks, months, maybe even years. There's a certain joy in being with the people that you love. Well, this Advent season is all about this anticipation of Jesus coming again, this looking to the heavens, looking to the clouds, and knowing that Jesus promised when when he ascended to heaven, that he would come back someday. That, that for us as Christians should be a huge source of joy for us, knowing that what we see around us, what the brokenness that we see in the world is not the final definition of what life is supposed to be like. That while, yes, we're in the midst of, 
of many problems in this world. And personally, many of you are experiencing problems in many different areas of your life. Um, we know, we know that God's got something much bigger and better planned for us. And so let's explore this idea of biblical joy. Because biblical joy is not simply about, am I happy or not? Biblical joy is much bigger than that. In fact, biblical joy is so big that even in the midst of our deepest griefs here in, in this life and in, in the world that we have right now, we can still find joy in our great God. Just as we've talked about finding peace and hope, we can find those things in God, even in the midst of our deepest griefs. Biblical joy is not about being happy. Biblical joy is about, about praising and exalting a great God. Whether that's public praise or private praise, it's all about exalting the, the God of glory. It's about, it's about quiet confidence in Him that even though maybe we've got bad news from the doctor or maybe we've got bad news from our accountant or maybe we've got bad news from the boss or wherever that bad news may come from, we still have joy because we have this unshakable confidence in God, a confidence that, that just gives us this overriding desire to tell people about Jesus, to tell people about what God has done, to give testimony of his great love. Now, as we go through this, we're going to hear the words of John the Baptist, pointing people to where they can find joy. And what he says probably can be applied to hope and peace as well. But today, let's focus on these things through this lens of peace, finding peace with God and, and find, I mean, finding joy with God and such joy that it causes us to want to share. You know what? Do you remember when, maybe you were always the generous type that, that even if you didn't have money to buy something, you, you made something for people. But for some people, it takes a while to get to that point where you are feeling generous and want to bless people. In fact, sometimes holidays for, I'm not just going to label the kids, I think even for some adults, it's more about the getting than the giving. Well, there's so much joy in the giving, and that is the heart of God. He has given, He has given, He has given, He has given. He has loyally loved His people. And so let's find great joy in that. The Bible is filled with references to joy. In fact, in the Old Testament, there are 13 root words in Hebrew that point people to joy. And those 13 root words are used 27, 27 different ways to, to describe joy. Joy is a huge part of the Old Testament, but also in the New Testament as well, where we read about finding joy in salvation and even, believe this or not, even finding joy in, in suffering as Jesus did. So just on that quick survey of just some of the biblical language for joy, we, we realize that that real, lasting, true joy is an important thing that God wants for his people. The Bible teaches us about it, appoints us to it. And so if you're at a place in your life where you're really struggling to, to find joy, where maybe life is, is as far from joy as maybe it, it could be, then listen. Listen up to, to what we're going to be talking about. Because John the Baptist gives the people who are cut to the heart uh, in this moment, to know what to do as they, as they were coming to the river to be baptized in this, in this baptism of repentance. Um, you know, our joy is not based in the stuff that goes on around us. Our, our, our joy is not based in the circumstances. Our joy is not even based in our kids, even though many of us long to be around our kids. Our joy is based in our great God and what he has done for us through Jesus Christ and how he has poured his spirit out unto us. God has testified of his great love to us. And so let's find, love, find our joy in this great and mighty God. Let's explore this through the lens of a two-way relationship with God. Two ways. Not simply, gimme, 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 God, but thank you for your gracious generosity 
this is how I want to demonstrate my love for you. And in doing that is where we were going to find our joy. So last week we saw how John pointed people to repent, to turn from their sin. He also let them know that he was coming to prepare the way for the Messiah, the one who is ultimately going to come to provide the real joy that we all long for. And so let's explore the so what that that John is talking about. Let's explore the who's coming and let's explore the what's next in this passage to discover real eternal joy, the joy that our loving Heavenly Father um, has and what he wants to share with his children. So the so what? What is the so what? Well, so what is the joy comes through the fruit of repentance? Joy through the fruit of repentance. Huh? Okay, maybe, maybe you weren't expecting to hear something like that, but, but, but hear me out. To repent in the quiet of your heart is good. We talked about that last week. The scriptures are filled with examples of people being called to repent, to turn away from sin and to turn towards God, to turn away from the evil that they were doing and to turn towards holiness and righteousness. And John practiced this baptism of of repentance to give sort of this outward um, action that would remind them of of that decision, to maybe solidify in in their own mind that they have decided to repent, but all of that would be meaningless. Repenting in your mind, in your heart, all that would be meaningless if it didn't bear out in, in fruit. And when the scripture talks about fruit in somebody's life, that means that it's bearing something good, that that, that fruit is pointing Godward and that our lives are, are, are producing something that people can see, and, it, and it's produced in, in other people as well through the Holy Spirit's work. And so all words and no action are really meaningless. They don't really change situations, do they? And so John is calling his people to bear the fruit of repentance, to not just in their mind say, I can't do that anymore, but actually to walk in the other way. Because when we don't, it just leads to greater disappointment, greater dejection, greater depression at times. We need to turn. Many of you may have heard of the movie Hillbilly Elegy, which is out on Netflix right now, or maybe some of you have read the book. Um, I've read sort of a synopsis of of the book. Uh, We have it at home. I just haven't picked it up to read it just yet, but I was I was I was blessed and, and, and touched in many ways as I was hearing the story of this book of a young man who, who against all odds, rose out of the grips of poverty. But in order to do that, he saw a lot of things going on. And, and the book kind of, kind of you know, counterpositions J.D. Vance, the author, and, and the, 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 the subject of this book with his mom, who just constantly made empty promises, said she would quit taking drugs, and yet it just kept a grip on her life. And over and over and over, she would make these empty promises of change. Whereas J.D. found that in faith and in pursuing something positive like education, he could could bear different fruit in his life. And so by turning from from the, the mental attitudes that oftentimes will grip people in poverty and to pursue the things that would help him to, to ascend out of that, he experienced the fruit of change. That's what repentance should do for us. It should drive us to, to real change in our life. And so the fruit of re, fruits of repentance that John is talking about here that he's, that he's pointing the, his listeners to are the same kind of things that, that the gospel writers are pointing us to as well. Our faith, living in covenant relationship with God, a loyal love with God, compels us to be faithful to Him. We want to bring honor and glory to Him. We realize all that God has done for us in sending Jesus. And so our demonstration of love is to turn from evil and turn towards righteousness. And so He instructs the crowds how to do this. You know, the, the crowds in general. And it, behind this, maybe you have some of the other gospel accounts where John is specifically pointing out the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Doesn't quite do that here in, in Luke, but we can see that this, this 
um, instruction that he's giving to the crowds is important for everybody that the fruit of repentance includes generosity. Now, let me just say this real quick. John talks about three different things here. There are so many different fruits of, of, of repentance, but here are three I think that we, we can learn from our, ourselves. Generosity is an important thing. The people at that time, um, you know, we talked a little bit about this last week, had sort of lost the light. They were, they were living uh, to try to placate God, living to try to, to gain favors from God, living in order to see the Messiah come to kick the Romans out, but they weren't necessarily living fully for the glory of God. And so John is kind of taking this and turning it upside down on their head because sometimes people back then felt like, well, if you were poor, you were poor for a reason. You know, God must have cursed you, but that's not always the case. Sometimes the, the poor around us is an opportunity for us to live in generosity as God has given us to us generous, generously. So if you had two tunics, let me use this in, in current terms. If you have a couple of t-shirts or undershirts or something that you wear under your clothes, you only need one. Give the other one to somebody who doesn't have one. So living generously, love that person so much you're willing to share your tunic. I mean, it's something that, you know, people wear just about every day. It's something that oftentimes is not noticed, but it's something that's appreciated. So be generous. Live out that second great commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. And as you do that, you're doing the first one. You're loving God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then there were some tax collectors there, and they asked, what must they do? You know, tax collectors, for those of you who may not be familiar with uh, the, you know, the biblical stories of in, the, in the Gospels, tax collectors in, in the first century were really hated because they worked for the Romans, and anybody who worked for the Romans was hated. But not only were they hated because they worked for the Romans, but oftentimes they took more than they were supposed to. You know, thing, some things don't quite change. Tax collectors today, oftentimes we will pause and kind of, oh, okay, you know, the IRS is three words, three letters, I should say, that does elicit fear in a lot of people. But the New Testament shows us, you know, in one particular example, Zacchaeus, who was life was completely changed. He was a chief tax collector, so, so he was a chief cheat, and his life was completely turned around in repentance. And in repentance, he stopped cheating. He stopped stealing. In fact, he repaid those that, that he had cheated. And so John is telling the, the tax collectors here to collect no more than you're authorized to do. He's not saying that you don't have a job. He's not saying don't do your job. He's just saying do it honestly. That is a fruit of repentance, living honestly. And then lastly, the, the soldiers. I don't think that they were Roman soldiers. They were probably soldiers either attached to uh, the temple or maybe assigned to these tax collectors because some of the taxes collected may have been going to Jerusalem. And he addresses them too. The fruit of their repentance is contentment, that they weren't going to use their position to strong arm people to give them things that they didn't really deserve, that they were going to live kindly and with contentment. They weren't going to use their position to extort, but they were going to use their position for good. These are just three ways that we find joy. Because when we live the way God wants us to live, there's great joy there. When we know that we're pleasing God, there's great joy there. I mean, remember back when you were a kid and you did something that pleased your parent and they smiled or they complimented you? Remember the joy you felt when you did that? That's kind of what we're talking about here. When we live repentantly, where there's the fruit of repentance in our life, we bring great joy to God and that should bring great joy to us. And so, the, where, to where to find joy? The fruit of repentance. So are you living a life that is, maybe it's, you, know, got, you have some sin somewhere in your life? Have you not been as honest as you should be? Have you not been as generous as you should be? No, I want to skip that first one. Have you not been as content uh, in life as you should be? And as you go through Scripture and, and the Scriptures identify other things for us to focus on, repent, turn from those things, and live out the fruit of repentance. So that's the so what. So the so what is, yeah, you can find joy. You can find real life. You can find, and all these things we've been talking about here this Advent season, you can find hope. You can find peace. You can find joy. Next week we're talking about love as we live repentant lives. But there's even better news coming. There's a who's coming. 
joy comes from the Holy Spirit. And I don't want to leave out another very important person who's coming here because John is preparing the way for Jesus. Um, but he tells something very interesting about this coming Messiah. The Messiah is going to be the one who's going to, to die on the cross. The Messiah is going to be the one who's going to restore uh, God's people to a right relationship, that we're going to new, live in a new covenant through, as we celebrated last week in the communion, through the, the, the shedding of his blood. But all this becomes real when, when he baptizes us with the Holy Spirit and fire. You know, Zechariah, John the Baptist's father, said that his son would be called the prophet of the Most High. And John, and John is doing exactly what we see other prophets doing. He's following in that prophetic, those prophetic footsteps of, say, Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. You know, they called out sin, those prophets, and they called people to repent of sins. We've talked about that. But they also called people to live in a covenant faithfulness with God that they would be faithful. Go back and reread the prophet Hosea and how the story of his life with his prostitute wife being a, a, an, an example of the adulterous nation of Israel, always turning away from God. Well, the prophets tried to call people back into right relationship. They tried to exhort the people to live by faith, to, to live in holiness. And so the, the prophets you know, you know, forth told the truth to the people and foretold of the coming of what's, what was to happen. So Isaiah spoke about the, the, coming, uh, the coming Emmanuel, God with us, the wonderful counselor, mighty God, prince of peace, who would go on to become the suffering servant, who would bear our sins, who would heal us through his stripes that he would experience. Jeremiah prophesied of a new covenant to come, that God would write his covenant on his people's hearts. And then Ezekiel would talk about replacing a hard heart with a heart of flesh and, and talk about how God would breathe on the dry bones and bring the people back to life. I mean, can you think of something any more joyous than the dead coming back to life? I mean, during COVID-19, you know, the, 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 just the lists of people that have, that, that have died this year, whether from COVID-19 or, or not. I mean, even in our own congregation, we've lost loved ones that we've not been able to hold memorial services for. We, there are celebrities that we've seen that, that have died. There are so many different people, extended family members in, in, in our homes, you know, in our families. Can you imagine anything more joyous than, than resurrection? But let's, let's not forget that the real hope of resurrection is not seeing our, our, our loved ones who have died before us, but, but seeing Jesus, seeing our Savior, seeing the glory of God without the brokenness of this world around us. John is giving us some clues here of what's really, really important. And, and this hope of resurrection is going to come through the pouring out that this Messiah who dies on the cross is going to pour out his spirit and we're going to be baptized, not with a baptism of repentance that was a temporary thing, but this permanent baptism of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit has poured into our lives. And, and this, that, this baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire is a baptism that saves ushering a true spiritual life and, and covenant love with God. It's a baptism that purifies it, that our, our sin is taken away once and for all. And it's a baptism of judgment, deeming the faithful righteous and, and God including in the covenant community. I think when we hear that word judgment at times, we, we look at it simply from the negative point of view of God saying, no, you're not getting in, but let's also recognize that there's coming a day when on that judgment where where the righteous who are righteous because of what Christ has done is allowed in that's a cause for celebration that's a cause for joy to know that God has saved us through his son he has baptized us with his spirit he has poured his new covenant uh, into us and written it on our hearts and that we are children of God and so 
We have this baptism of repentance. This, the, I should say these fruits of repentance where we find joy. We have find joy in knowing that we've been empowered, made alive through the Holy Spirit, that the Messiah has died for our sins and poured his spirit out into us. And we are now saved and included into the covenant family. What a joy that is. And then the, the, what's next is we find joy in proclaiming that good news. Uh-oh, here we go. I, I know. For some of you, the thought of actually sharing the gospel with somebody causes your blood pressure to rise, or maybe you actually stopped breathing for a second there. But hear me out. What do we see in the New Testament? The people, the apostles, the, 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 the people that, that hear the good news, what do, we, what do we see them do? They go out and they tell people about Jesus. The issue of judgment it is an issue of, yes, we are in, but there are some who aren't. And how do we help them how do we help them become children of God? Well, we have to proclaim. Paul tells us in, in the book of Romans that faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of God. We need to proclaim that good news. I mean, the text tells us about, about the, the chaff being separated away, that, that Christ has this winnowing fork and that there is going to be this separation. The, the other day I was watching an, a news special about local gifts you could buy here in the Tampa Bay area, and they featured um, a chocolate shop in Tarpon Springs, and they showed uh, the owner of the shop um, grinding the chocolate, uh, the cocoa beans, and then separating the chaff. And she did it by blowing a hair dryer into this big bowl that she had crushed, uh, that put the crushed uh, beans in, and the the air from the hair dryer blew the chaff away. It, I connected with that because when I roast coffee. There's a husk on coffee beans that has to blow away before you use the coffee. We see those kinds of images and realize that, yes, the scriptures tell us a lot about God separating, separating out his holy people away from the evil in the world. And we see examples of God's judgment you know, from, right from the very beginning. Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden because of sin. Noah builds an ark because God's going to flood the earth because he's so grieved of the sin. Um, and then there's the punishment after the people built the golden calf. Time and time again, we see in the exile. We see all these stories of God's judgment. It's a very real part of the biblical message. God is redeeming a people for himself from a broken and dark world. So knowing that, we need to... We need to proclaim the good news. But just let me share this with you. There is something so joyous in knowing that you are able to proclaim the saving message that saved your life, that how the Holy Spirit moved your heart from disbelief to belief in, in saying, yes, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. There is something so joyful in proclaiming that message. Do people always accept it? No. No, they don't. Our men's Bible study, we were in Acts 24 through 26. The Apostle Paul boldly proclaimed the gospel to Festus and to King Agrippa. They didn't accept it. They didn't. In fact, they, they mocked him. But yet he still proclaimed. He found joy in proclaiming the gospel because of what Jesus had done for him. So don't fear don't get stressed about the gospel. Just keep sharing because sometimes people do receive. And I cannot tell you how joyful that is to watch a person come to faith in Christ Jesus, to repent of his or her sins, to live in love with Christ, and to turn their life to him. There's something amazing about that. Something so amazing that 11 of the 12 apostles were willing to die to do that. The 12th apostle, John, was willing to be exiled onto a, into an island in order to, to do that. And we see even Paul eventually was executed because he loved to proclaim the gospel. Yes, the world is not going to like it. Yes, the world's going to push back. But where do we find our real joy? We find it in God. Joy is about exalting God. Joy is about finding our confidence in God. Joy is about looking up and seeing His glory and not looking down and seeing all the problems. When people respond in faith, when they confess Jesus as their Savior, that is a great source of joy. And we see here that John, who also was going to lose his life because he was willing to proclaim the good news, willing to call out sin, verse 18 so with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. It didn't stop him. Let's not let it stop us. Let's let 
the joy of our salvation motivate us to bear fruits of repentance, to live in the power of the Spirit, and, and to keep proclaiming the good news. We, joy, we all want it. We, we all really want to live joyful lives. So how do we discover it? We discover it by living biblically, by, as I just said, living out the fruits of repentance, living in the power of the Spirit, proclaiming the good news so others can come to know Christ Jesus. Joy. It's there. Just look up. Look up and know that the Lord is your light and your salvation. Whom shall you fear? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we confess at times we do not always live in joy. Sometimes we live in fear. Sometimes we live in anger. Sometimes we live defeated lives. Sometimes we live as if we are the conqueror. Father, I pray that you would help us this week as we continue in this Advent season to continue to look up and realize that you are the great conqueror, that you are the source of strength, that you are the exalted God, and that we we will live to exalt you and find our confidence in you. And so thank you. Father, we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Father, if there's someone here who has, who has kind of walked away from the faith or maybe is walking too, uh, into this faith for the first time, I pray that they, along with all of us, would recognize and, and to say that we are sorry for our sins, but we're thankful for Jesus' death on the cross that saves us from our sins, and we want to live for you. We want to live for you. We make Jesus our Lord. And so bless us this week. Bless us to be able to share our joy with others. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
It has been such a joy to worship with all of you today. Um, Just a few quick announcements before we head out. If you would like to share your gratitude for what God has done uh, by blessing the church with a gift, you can do that at our website, www.frctampa.org slash give. You can use our secure online giving portal, or you may mail a check to 8283 West Hillsboro Avenue, Tampa, Florida, 33615, and you can make that check out to First Reformed Church of Tampa. Also, we are preparing for Christmas Eve. Right now, the service is planned for 6 p.m. here at the church, Um, and we've got a couple of overflow areas uh, lined up just in case the crowd gets big. Now, we've been doing a survey trying to ascertain whether we need to add a second service, and so right now, the numbers don't seem to indicate that, But be ready, if we find out that there are gonna be large parties coming, we wanna make sure we can safely seat people here. Stay tuned to uh, the website, stay tuned to the emails that go out, the phone calls that go out, and to the flock leaders that call the church members, uh, or just simply call the church office and get the latest information. Uh, We'll try to, to, to let everybody know if we're going to go to those two services. But right now, we're planning on a 6 p.m. service here at the church, which will be live streamed on our YouTube live streaming channel. And so you can participate from home at the same time. Well, be blessed, everyone. I hope that this Advent season is one where you've been growing in your hope, your peace. And now this week, let's focus on finding our joy in the Lord. Receive this blessing and benediction as you head into the coming week, as we wait for our coming Savior, the ultimate hope of the world. Psalm 27, we started there today, let's end there today. Psalm 27, verse 14, wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Be blessed. I love you. Have a great week.